Rock and Rule. What a strange, obscure piece of animation we have here. This was supposed to be a landmark as the first animated feature made by the Canadian animation studio Nelvana. Not only that, but it was also originally intended for kids and be a spin-off to their 1978 TV special, The Devil and Daniel Mouse. However, several changes later, including making the film geared more towards adults, the distributors, MGM, absolutely did not care for this movie, barely even releasing it in theaters. Thank God that Nelvana would pick themselves back up by making animated kids shows afterwards, because otherwise, they would have been dead. However, funny enough, over the years, the movie actually gained quite a cult following thanks to the soundtrack that featured original songs from many recognizable rock names like Earth, Wind & Fire, Cheap Trick, and Iggy Pop. So now that Rock and Rule is finally given the spotlight here, will it probably hold on to the title as the first ever Canadian animated feature in English, or does the movie not rock nor rule? Let's find out. The Story At first glance, this seems like your typical rising rock band story, where a small indie band gets the chance of a lifetime to work with a big name record label, but because of it they would be on the verge of breaking up and uh, yeah, you probably get the picture by now. However, there is a unique spin to this and that's by completely changing the antagonist. Instead of having a record company be filled with greed, the villain is a legendary musician named Mock who wants the girl of the group to sing in order to summon a demon from hell to make him immortal. Although it still is pretty predictable to know how the outcome of the plot would be, it does offer something unique and interesting that does grab the audience's attention. However, one big part of that would be because of the world that is set in. It sets up this entire post-apocalyptic world that's in such a catastrophic state that is far different from our own that can have its own functions, like how people could survive in a highly polluted area, let alone that we're mostly looking into the slum part of both hometown and Nuke York. Not only that, but we also look into the domain of Mock, who is also referred to as Magic Man, and once we enter his place, he really does emphasize that to where it feels like we found ourselves in another world that's different than the one we've just settled into. And you say, no, thank you. I'm very disappointed. Hey, listen. I'm still hopeful. If I have to point out one big downfall to the story, it would be more because of the characters. As it is one of those rock band movies, it does try to be more character driven, but I'll get more into that later, but I'll just say now that while some of the characters do make this enjoyable, others make it also feel intolerable. The story does set up this pretty awesome world with some exciting stuff happening, but it's more what's going on in that world that's less stellar. The Animation Considering that this is coming from a Canadian animation studio who's known for making animated TV shows for kids, I'm surprised that they came out with a quality this good. I mean, when you look into the character animation and the way that they move, it's actually very smooth and realistic. Maybe some rotoscoping was done on some characters, but this showed that some highly talented animators got into work on this project. But I just want to get this little thing out of the way. One thing that does seem odd here is the mouth movements of Mock. He's constantly puckering his lips to where it looks like they're trying to pop out of his face. Bring on the Edison balls. Oh, I'm, I'm sure you're into reaching new levels of consciousness. But enough about that little weird thing. Let's get on to the background, which looks like a dirty mess. Oh, don't take that as a bad thing. That's what the crew was aiming for. The places that the characters go to, like Omtown and Nuke York, feel more like a toxic area. A place where you'd most likely meet someone that's really shady, or you question how healthy the air is in there. In contrast, you have Mock's place where it feels cleaner, high class, and everything is more in order with more use of color. Also, considering that it is from the early 1980s and is heavily themed with music, 
it does have its music video tendencies and use the latest technology at the time, which in this case is computer animation. Luckily though, it knows how to work within its limits. But then you have the designs. What it's trying to go for is kind of something like out of a Disney cartoon where everyone is this animalistic humanoid where they either have big ears and a muzzle or just the tip of their noses are darker. On their own, they do look well done and it's great how the movie has a large variety among both the cast and the extras, but it's hard to feel like it's a good idea for a movie like this. I mean, this is a film that's mostly trying to be serious and the characters are moving in a realistic manner. But then you have this design that looks more like a cartoon and it feels like it just doesn't fit. Not to mention that the more you think of it, the less reason there is to have the characters look like anthropomorphic mice and dogs instead of, you know, just humans. I mean, sure, the American version does give a good explanation at the start, but with the original Canadian one, all it could say is just because. But even with that, it still doesn't change how the animation is strong with what they got. The characters. You really do have a massive mix of some characters that you could enjoy and some that can make this movie hard to watch. Allow me to start off with the better characters that are actually not from the band, but actually on the opposite side with Mock's area. Starting with Mock himself, he is a devious artist that knows what he wants. He knows how to put on a show, either publicly or privately, but also can't really hide his massive need to accomplish his goal of unleashing this demon for the name of Mock to live forever. Along with him are his bumbling assistants, Zip, Toad, and Sleazy. In a way, they are your typical dumb evil sidekicks where they have more muscles than brains, but you have also the good-hearted one, the mean one, and the more serious one. But they are still fun to watch, since they do add a bit of classic comedy, and even their sister Cindy can add some enjoyability when she would be with Angel. Bless you, yeah! This is the hottest anti-gravity club in the city, you know. But you let mutants in and it spoils everything, know what I mean, honey? But then you have the band, and let me start off with the worst thing from this film, Omar. Wow, it actually takes a lot of effort to be this much of a despicable jerk. Throughout the film, he's just absolutely selfish, forcefully puts himself as the leader of the pack, often walks away when the band really needs him, and there are a lot more times when the villains have the upper hand over him than him being useful. The only indication why this movie is telling us to root for him is because he loves Angel, and that's it. And the others don't really offer anything special either. Dizzy is the brains, Stretch is the goofball, and Angel is the strong, good-hearted girl that's also a bit of a damsel in distress. And that's the biggest problem about these characters. Almost all of them are one-dimensional with not much to offer other than Mock, his thugs, and maybe Angel. When they're not good, they really do bring the movie down. I can forgive this movie for some enjoyable characters, but some of the good guys here really do leave you with a bad taste. Rock and Rule didn't put out the greatest show, but it can still have its unique moments that can have you remember it afterwards. There are times when it can really flop with a predictable story and unlikable protagonists, but it does keep itself away from being bad with other characters that are well-crafted, an interesting post-apocalyptic world, and some strong animation, on top of an awesome soundtrack. If you're a huge fan of early 80s rock, or you're someone who's always looking for pieces of obscure animation, then you might be interested in checking this one out. Also, if you ever do decide to watch it, I advise you to see it like how it was originally intended with the Canadian uncut version. The differences between this one and the American version is that there are some scenes that are extended, it has the original voice of Omar, and the audio is a lot cleaner. Will it make the movie better? Most likely not. But the best way to describe this is that it's an, um, interesting find.
guys, this is Animat, and I gotta say, it definitely was interesting to check out Rock and Rule. Not necessarily because of the movie itself, but mostly because of everything about it. Mostly how it is an obscure Canadian cult-following animated feature, and all that kind of stuff. It's mostly with all of its backstory, and how it ended up being created, and how it actually did eventually find a small audience for it. And honestly, it is actually pretty tough for me to try to figure out how the movie itself would actually be a cult following. It definitely does have a lot of its flaws, but I will say at the same time, there are definitely some good things to mention about it. Like, of course, a lot of the animation is fantastic. Then also, the soundtrack is purely awesome. Like, honestly, if there's anything that really does deserve to get a cult following from Rock and Rule, it would have to be from the soundtrack. But, yeah, I would say, though, that in terms of its mark in animation history, I guess with Rock and Rule, it's one of those examples of that quick trend that actually happened somewhere between the late 70s and the early 80s. And what I'm talking about is that there was a little bit of a trend where animated features wanted to take themselves a lot more seriously. Like, this was during a really dark time for Disney, and animation wants to prove themselves that they could be much more uh, than just being a Disney animated feature. So they would end up incorporating a lot more adult tones, and in fact, it would actually be a lot less of a comedy. Or if it is a, a comedy, then uh, they wouldn't mind to go a little bit more risque with it. And especially with Rock and Rule, that it was actually based on this uh, little Canadian TV special. And when you actually do compare both of them, like with uh, Daniel Mouse and Rock and Rule, it's like Godforsaken night and day, but you can still see the Godforsaken connections. Um, it is still actually rather interesting to see that little time period when animation wanted to take itself more seriously and try to be a bit more adult. Uh, another great example of an animated feature that was during that time period where it wants to be a little bit more serious and it does try to incorporate a little bit of some adult tones would have to be Don Bluth's The Secret of Nymph. And also one more thing I want to mention about uh, reviewing Rock and Rule is that there was at one point, or actually no, this is actually throughout the entire feature, that I always feel like there's this resemblance with Mock, where he feels so much like David Bowie in Jim Henson's Labyrinth. But I know I cannot make that comparison because technically, uh, Rock and Rule was released before Labyrinth. So it's not like the people at Nelvana actually took inspiration and all that kind of stuff, but there is still that strong sense of familiarity right over there. Except, uh, David Bowie doesn't always pucker up his freaking lips like this all the freaking time. It's like, how do you even talk like that? I don't know. But, yeah, um, overall with Rock and Roll, there are some great things, but honestly it is hard to see how the movie itself can be a cult following. Especially when it's the kind of film that would have a character like Omar. Like, seriously, screw that freaking guy. But! Anyways, uh, that's pretty much gonna be it for Rock and Roll, and now it is time that we shall go and move on to a Patreon request. Yes, and this time is going to be coming from, uh, Jasmine Salwana. So, I just want to mention you guys right now that if you guys would like to be like Jasmine and you want to go and support my work and get some awesome rewards at the same time, including getting a review and also seeing my videos before anyone else, then all you have to do is go to patreon.com slash animat. But at the same time, if you guys would like to suggest an animated film you would like me to review and I would put onto the animation hat, then all you have to do is write me an email at animatsreviews at gmail.com. So, with all that said and done, what is it that Jazzy suggests me to go and review for this one? Well, interestingly enough, we are actually going to be looking into one of the works of one of the most legendary and most highly acclaimed directors in animation. But interestingly enough, 
we are going to be looking at this director's directorial debut. Now, interestingly enough, there are some people out there who actually do think that uh, this director started out with a princess in a valley. But in actuality, this director started out with a thief. Where you were a real nice guy. Get serious, 